for uh, inviting me. It's it's been a fantastic workshop so far, and I, I really uh, it's, it's a really hard act for me to follow this. So I'm I'm really pleased to be here, and I just want to give you a bit my per perspective on what AI enabled medical imaging could entail and what work we've uh, done towards that direction. So in um, medical imaging, we typically fall into one of the following groups. We either acquire images, so we generate raw data using some imaging sensor, an MRI or a CT. We then reconstruct the images, so we transform the raw sensor data, the signals basically, into a 2D, 3D or multidimensional image for viewing. And then there comes the normal post-processing. That's kind of the fields I've been traditionally falling into where we filter images. We segment structures, we register images taken from different scanners to reduce motion. And then comes the image analysis, which is a bit more abstract, where we construct models, where we detect and classify diseases. And then finally, these images are also interpreted by the clinicians. So there's very much a uh, sequential approach going from the image sensor down to the clinician or up to the clinician rather. Um, but um, machine learning is increasingly applied within each of these different tasks, uh, but less so across these tasks. And this is what I'm quite interested in and want to talk a little bit about today. So in medical imaging, we've heard about some of the challenges, in particular in uh, Marlene de Brown's talk earlier today, is we've got lots of different kinds of data. First of all, image data could be quite degraded because there are artifacts, there's patient motion, there's imaging noise due to the sensor. Uh, we do not always have really nice, large, well-curated and annotated data sets as is afforded by ImageNet. Then clinical data by nature is much more worried. So we've got differences across different scanning systems, different field strengths, different hospital sites, and so forth. And of course, there's this you know, big problem of this black box approach, this kind of disappointment that Michael Unser before was expressing that things work really nicely, but you don't quite know why. And, and there's some beautiful math behind there, which is yet to be discovered. So the focus of this talk is how we could apply machine learning along the imaging pipeline, right from acquisition to interpretation. And we're doing a mix of modular approaches, but it become increasingly more integrated and going on the road of end-to-end -end approaches. I'm showing some exemplars from cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and chest CT for lung cancer. And there I'm going to focus on how we could actually work on these, these data sets we have. How can we enrich these, do um, more realistic data augmentation, also maybe some more image quality control at the same time. So image quality can uh, really affect further downstream tasks. For example, cardiac segmentation here. So on the left-hand side, you see a high quality cardiac, short axis view and a resulting segmentation. Really quite nice, you see the blood pool labeled in blue, the myocardium in green and the left ventricle in yellow. Um, however, if there's a low quality instance of this image, um, and we then just run our vanilla, say, unit segmentation approach, our result segmentation won't be very satisfactory. So we've got segmentation failure. Quite often, we would not have the option to directly um, invite the patient back into the scanner or recall them to take a better picture. So we have to work on the data there is either discarded completely, which is terrible in terms of patient workflows or calling back in the patient, or we could actually try to do something about these images. Um, we can actually try and retrospectively improve the image quality so that we might be able to improve the segmentation. So here we've done that. I explain that in, in a moment how. Um, so if you are able to restore the image quality, we get a really nice picture. But we also then, if you then run a UNET, for example, for segmentation, we get something which is comparable to the um, high quality segmentation on the top left. It's not identical if you look carefully and you see also a difference uh, still to the original image, which we can quantify. Now, it's quite important if you work on image quality that you understand what image artifacts are there and how or by what they are actually caused. So that requires some understanding of, of the image scanning system and the underlying imaging physics and the acquisition. So here's some two real patient images, one good quality image on the left. You see really nice, sharp, crisp image. You can see the myocardium quite clearly, even the papillary muscles. 
On the right hand side, you see a motion artifact. It's not only just a smaller heart and a smaller myocardium and a bit darker in contrast, but you don't see a really clear outline of the myocardium to the blood pool. And the reason for this is there's a temporal motion blur. So there's something has happened during the image acquisition, which has degraded the image quality. So they have to go back into how these data are acquired. So for cardiac imaging, you have to do ECG triggering. You have to understand when and where to acquire the case space matrix at each point in the cardiac cycle. So normally you've got different frames for each cardiac, um, each temporal point in the cardiac cycle. And you, you acquire um, lines as you go along until all the frames of all the um, time points have been filled. And then you could do something like an inverse Fourier transform or some more sophisticated imagery construction to get a nice high quality set of Cine MR images. However, sometimes things go wrong. And there these um, lines of case space could get mixed up across the different um, temporal points. And then you get a, frame, uh, a, a corrupted case space. If they then do a reconstruction, then you get exactly this kind of low quality image I've been showing you earlier on. So that's quite easy to, to understand, but how can we do something about it? So here we said, well, actually, uh, we can do data augmentation. So we're using a very large um, uh, database, UK Biobank, which will have 100,000 images. Uh, we, we start off with a, a couple of thousand images of high quality um, acquisitions of volunteers. There could be uh, people with, with uh, heart problems, but I think generally there are, there are fairly healthy volunteers. However, in the clinic, we are more likely to have poor quality images due to patients being imaged. But starting off with good quality images, we can apply different corruption level of, of case space by just deliberately swapping lines of case space across the cardiac cycle and then reconstructing the images to get a increasingly degraded set of images we can, which we can use to train neural networks. So because we know how this artifact arises, we can then artificially generate realistic, poor quality images, which is kind of analogous to, to data augmentation and computer vision, where you might wiggle around some, some cats in, in ImageNet, translate, rotate, zoom, and so on. But here we actually do something which is physiologically motivated. So how can we use these augmented data? Well, we can train deep neural networks the network of your choice really to do one of the following. We can do direct image quality control. We can just use it to curate our databases to, to basically sort out the good from the bad and the ugly and ask to rescan patients. Maybe while they're already lying in the scanner, we can actually already see whether the image is, is poor quality by doing a quick classification task. We can do motion reconstruction to avoid rescanning patients. So basically we can retrospectively curate our database and, and rescue poor quality data. Or we can use it to solve further downstream tasks. For example, we want to segment or classify disease. So image quality control would be a very simple classification um, a process where we would just decide whether an image, if we see it as good or poor quality, because we can generate a large training database and that would be similar or analogous to um, classifying between, between dogs and cats on, on ImageNet. So we can use, again, a very simple um, encoder style um, network. We can do motion reconstruction by basically restoring poor quality image data to their uh, high quality equivalent because we have training pairs of high quality data which we've artificially degraded so we can actually for real poor quality data use that to actually find good quality versions of it and again you can use a unit style architecture encoder decoder or whatever you, you would like. Or we could actually say, well, we could do it directly from case space because this is where this particular artifact actually occurs. And that, of course, the question is, how do we do that? We basically want to go directly from the signals to a motion corrected high quality image space. So what we did here is to take some inspiration from image reconstruction of undersampled case space. And you've seen talks today about compressed sensing, about deep spline. So it's a very active field in general. And of course the deep learning uh, world has a lot to offer there as well. So what people do there is they, they train again networks on um, uh, un deliberately undersampled data where they've got the fully sampled 
instance of it. So let's show awake lines of case space, train against uh, a high quality reconstructed image, um, and then basically choose then an under sampling trajectory with an under sampled case space and uh, reconstruct a high quality image. And that's used uh, doing, using a, that's implement using a reconstruction network, again, of your choice and some data consistency term. Now, what's slightly different here is that this is uh, an undersampled case space. Now, here we've got a fully sampled case space, but where we know that some of the lines of case space are wrong, that could come from a different point in the cardiac cycle, we just don't know which in the real case. Um, in uh, our simulated augmented case, of course, we do know where they come from. So what we can do is that instead of uh, feeding a, an undersampled acquisition with an undersampling trajectory, we can feed in a fully sampled acquisition, um, resulting in a case space where we know it's, it's fully sampled, but some of the lines are wrong. So there we could then apply a detection network, which detects which lines are wrong, uh, which and throw away these wrong lines, and then just formulate basically um, uh, an, an undersampled um, reconstruction network out of our problem, which gives us a fully sampled reconstruction which, with the artifacts corrected. So we're actually taking out the, the um, uh, motion artifacts from the ECG mistriggering. triggering. As the next step, we actually want to solve further downstream tasks. So we could just do that and then apply UNET to, to the result and get nice, nice quality segmentations. But here we actually say, well, why don't we solve everything in one go? We actually feed in 2D plus time corrupted case space data. So the full cardiac CNS sequence, 2D CNS sequence into the reconstruction network. We do the artifact detection with a data consistency term resulting in a 2D plus time corrected image, but then we also apply a segmentation network like a unit at the same time. So we get just a much more difficult training objective, which takes us into that slightly dodgy um, zone where we have to have the balance of these different loss functions, which used to be energy functions in, in the old days, of course, and we have to balance them slightly off. What we found here was quite interesting. We didn't only find that in improved reconstruction, uh, results in, 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 in better images and then that results in better segmentations. But we also found that if you put in the segmentation task as well, it also improved the reconstruction. Now that was an interesting finding because it actually showed us that these tasks actually mutually help each other. So they, they influence each other. So it's actually quite beneficial not to do this in a sequential or modular way, but actually in a more integrated end to end way. So what we got out of that was images like these. So you see on the bottom left, a motion degraded image um, and the difference image too, because this is an augmented case, which you're just showing here for illustrative purposes. Um, uh, so you see a big different image and a degraded segmentation, but then once we've done the integrated motion correct, corrupt, the corruption, if you want restoration um, or motion reconstruction and segmentation, you get a really good segmentation and uh, very little uh, difference to the original image. Now, of course, you've applied this to unseen data, to patient data with real motion scenarios that we've shown in, in our work um, at, at Media and TMI that there's the benefit as well. So that's the first part. The second part I want to talk about uh, AI-enabled lung cancer imaging, which is a bit more premature work, but we've been working on this for quite some time. We just, we just, it's, it's, it's still in the making in a way. And they were really interested again in, in data, which we normally don't get our hands on. So they've got really the problem that uh, we've got uh, patients who are going to develop lung cancer um, and we don't know when. Yeah, so these are just, uh, this is a real case you see here from the National Lung Screening Trial from the US. These images are taken a year apart and you see a small lung nodule developing over the course of two years. Now, normally we only see an image C on the right, a big nodule already there, and then the treatment options are quite limited. Um, if you're lucky, you get detected by accident. It's called an incidental lung nodule with image B. Say so if you've got um, uh, an accident or anything else, get a chest uh, CT, and then this is accidentally, incidentally picked up. But image A, you've got no, no chance really this being detected and um, getting a prognostic that this is going to be lung cancer at some point. So we lack that training data. We've got lots of images C, maybe some Bs, but no As. We've got no serial data here. 
So here to do this early detection on, on not much data, we decided to, to take a very pragmatic approach. We say, okay, let's take a lot of images with big lung nodules. We do some sort of in-painting of these larger nodules to generate pseudo-healthy versions. We can then have, have pairs of, of pseudo-healthy with a sick uh, or with large lung nodules images. Uh, we can train some sort of generator on it, which allows us to generate nodules like say an image B. And that allows us then maybe to solve further downstream tasks like classification of smaller nodules using this augmented training data. We've done that using um, Ulyanov's deep image prior method. The nice thing about that method, again, it's, a, it's kind of an encoder decoder architecture. It reconstructs an image within its kind of own context. So you don't need other training data. You literally train on a single image. So you don't mix other patient data with that, which I thought is, is really neat. And it allows you basically to um, starting from a mask of a nodule mask in the original image to basically reconstruct the entire image and fill in the, the mask nodule um, with context from the image itself. So it's a kind of like a self-learning approach. Uh, here are just some examples. On the top, you see some original nodules. Some are really small, like blobs, and some are really large and almost metastatic and branching out. Then you see in the middle row the, the equivalent uh, pseudo-healthy images obtained using deep image priors. But you still see some small artifacts if you look very carefully. But in the difference, you actually see that the images have been quite nicely reconstructed and uh, the nodule actually has been kind of filled out quite nicely. The next stage is to generate now a lung node. You could use GANs for that, um, but here we chose something else. We used, chose cellular automata using convolution neural networks, so a method by Gilpin. If you look at that website, which I'm showing there on the top right, there's some really cool demos where you can uh, have a go and, and, and train um, and, and download the code as well. But the idea is here really, again, just to train on a single data set. So that's what we do. We have our our pairs of um, pseudo healthy versus um, diseased images. We've got the, the nodule mask from, from these images and we can actually make lung nodules grow. And that's quite nice. It just literally uses the concept of cellular automata from the 1950s with a simple rule-based edge-based system um, and, and, and generates a nodule trained on a single image. Again, no other patient data is mixed with that. And here just is an example of uh, a lung nodule kind of being forced to grow. We're not making a claim that this is what happened in real life. This, this is like uh, pathologically realistic, but it just should be realistic enough to fool a neural network to accept this as a data augmentation, which can and can solve with a uh, and help with a further downstream task. So here's just some, some movies. I hope you can see them playing. On the left, you see the, the actual nodule. And on the right, you see the nodule kind of growing, generated using cellular automata. Again, you see it's not perfect, but it actually does something quite reasonable. And the contrast actually is quite nicely recovered from the Hounsfield units. So then uh, the recipe, of course, is, as I say, is in the pudding. Does it help if we add this to uh, this nodule generation uh, to a, a database? Here is the Luna Challenge data, a set of, of lung CTs where there are a lot of large nodules in terms of size, so 10, 10 millimeters or larger, but not very small ones, or smaller than 10 millimeter. Uh, if we add smaller nodules, you know, um, simulated to that database, can we detect them better? And we can to a certain degree. So it's a, a step in the right direction. And we got quite excited about this and are continuing our work in that, in that area to improve nodule detection of very, very small nodules. So just to conclude, I hope to sticking to time here. This is uh, uh, our work, some of our works on AI enabled medical imaging. Uh, which can operate along the entire imaging pipeline separately, modularly, or end to end, going from the image sensor to diagnostics or prognostics. Even we've looked at image quality and quality control. Uh, for cardiac imaging, we're looking at phys physically motivated data augmentation of, of MR artifacts, uh, but also to um, to generate data for augmentation in the training process. It's important for rare diseases. If you've got small data sets, different imaging protocols or scanner types. So we hope to actually work more and more along this entire imaging pipeline using different types of machine learning. 
I'd like to acknowledge all the researchers also as part of our Smart Art Consortium. And yes, uh, you've mentioned already some of the, the things we're involved in, in particular Melba, the journal, which I hope uh, can receive some of your submissions. Thank you.